Dr. Don DeYoung is the chairman of physical science at Grace College in Indiana. He holds an MS in physics from Michigan Technical University and a PhD in physics from Iowa State University. In his talk, Our Created Moon, Dr. DeYoung discusses four of the best evolutionary theories about the moon's origination, and then logically concludes that this lesser light could have been placed in its orbit only by an all-knowing, all-powerful creator. In astronomy, we hear a lot about faraway stars and galaxies, but for this talk, uh, we're going to stay closer to home. Let's go to the moon. You know, uh, during this session, the moon is overhead out there above the clouds, and it's the very same moon that Adam and Eve looked at, and also Galileo and Isaac Newton in years gone by. The moon is our nearest neighbor in space. It's about a quarter million miles away. Now, we're not in the light years, but just light seconds of distance. Now, our moon is about four times smaller than the Earth. And I thought since we're in a stadium, a good comparison would be uh, a baseball compared with a basketball. Imagine a trip to the moon. The gravity there is about one-sixth of what we're used to on the Earth. In fact, the moon would provide a guaranteed diet program. If you weigh 150 pounds on the Earth, on the moon, it would be down to 25 pounds. Of course, the moon has no water, no air, no clouds, no wind, really no weather at all. It might be a good place to visit, but uh, it's a place of extremes. You know, during the space age that we're in, uh, they're finding lots of new things, new discoveries. Perhaps you've heard of uh, new planets that are being found, not around our sun, but uh, objects that are circling other stars. They found about 150 new planets. They haven't named them, but they're out there. Apparently, the Creator has spread a lot of these objects through space. And we're also finding new moons. Even just the planet Saturn is up to 42 moons. I got to wondering about uh, what we're finding in space and uh, what these uh, other areas might be like. And as they're being studied, we are learning some of their properties. And I came up with kind of an illustration of what some of these new planets and moons look like. They're nasty places. Most of them have temperatures of 1,000 degrees or else they're very cold. They have poisonous gases. They have uh, crushing air pressures. It's uh, interesting uh, what we find in space. In fact, I think one of the real conclusions that we're learning from this space age is that the Earth is special. And uh, maybe I could just say it this way, there's no place quite like home. And uh, that's one of the grand conclusions that we're learning as time goes by. Now, back to the moon. There is something very special about this satellite that circles the Earth. I believe that the moon provides one of our strongest evidences for creation. And this includes the moon's origin and its age and also the design of the moon. And I would like to explore these with you for a while. So we begin with a question of uh, where the moon came from. How did it get in the sky? And in the scientific age, various ideas have been presented. In fact, many careers and billions of dollars your tax dollars have been spent trying to solve the problem of uh, how the moon got to be circling the earth. 
Over the decades, various natural origin theories have been proposed, and I'd like to survey them with you for a few moments. Now, stay with me. Uh, this is not a bowling pin. This is not a chicken drumstick. This is serious business. This is one of these lunar origin theories. In fact, this was the dominant theory back in the 1960s. This particular idea goes back to one of the sons of Charles Darwin. It was astronomer George Darwin who suggested that long ago, the moon broke away from a rapidly spinning Earth. Uh, George Darwin also thought that um, the Pacific Ocean Basin was the scar that was left behind when the moon separated from the Earth. As I look at this picture, uh, it reminds me of uh, riding a bicycle on a rainy day and the mud comes off the back wheel. It's sort of what this theory uh, describes. In fact, in this view, the moon is uh, the child of the Earth. Let's call it the daughter theory. There are some problems with this natural origin theory, as you might expect. For this to happen, the Earth would have to spin about 10 times faster than it does today. Uh, and this large amount of turning motion or, or angular momentum is just simply not available in the Earth-Moon system. Again, the Earth would have to turn in about two hours' time. If it did that, then we would be in danger of sailing off ourselves. but it does not happen, of course. There's another problem. A moon moving out from the Earth, as this uh, picture shows, would have to pass through what is called the Rausch or breakup limit. Now, uh, this is a, a boundary around the Earth that extends out about 10,000 miles from the Earth's surface. And any large object like the moon moving through this part of the Earth, it would be torn apart by the Earth's uh, gravity. In fact, if the moon moved within the Rausch limit, it would uh, be broken up into a, into a ring of material. As a comparison, the rings of Saturn lie within that planet's breakup limit. And so this is another uh, problem which uh, kind of shoots down the idea of the fission theory. And there's one additional serious problem with lunar fission. This goes back to 1969, when moon rocks were returned to the Earth during the Apollo project. As we have studied these moon rocks, we've come to realize that their composition is distinct from Earth rocks. For example, moon rocks are lacking in iron atoms. And the moon has no water whatsoever. And if the moon had broken off from the earth, it would have picked up some of this moisture. The moon rocks simply do not look like they came from the earth, as the fission theory uh, suggests. Next, after the fission theory, in the 1970s came the capture theory. And this dominated the astronomy world. In this idea, a wandering moon long ago approached the earth and it was captured by our gravity and has been circling the Earth ever since. Let's call this theory, since it's kind of a marriage, the spouse theory. Now, as I think about this, it's not really a, a valid origin theory because uh, it doesn't really tell where the moon comes from. It just sort of sneaks in from the bottom of the picture and comes in our direction. But uh, we'll let that pass for now. There are other problems. There is no clear mechanism of how the moon could be captured, how it could slow down and be carefully inserted into orbit on a single pass. In fact, as we do computer analysis of this, it's more likely that the moon would pick up speed and like crack the whip, it would get out of here in a hurry. It would gain speed. And there are other problems with capture. If it somehow was possible, it would likely lead to a, a moon orbit that was greatly elongated, like many comet orbits. It would uh, be non-circular. But when we consider the moon, its orbit is uh, very symmetric. It only deviates 5% from a perfect circle. The next idea is nebular. The nebular origin attempt, or also called the condensation theory, 
This one suggests that the Earth forms side by side with the moon from collapsing gas clouds. In fact, since they form together, let's call it the sister theory. The major problem this time is that initial gas clouds must somehow be compressed so that they shrink rather than expand. When you have a gas cloud in space, there are always competing forces. Gravity would like to shrink the cloud down, but gas forces cause the cloud to stretch out and disband and, and, and expand. An initial gas cloud must somehow be compressed to a critical size so that gravity takes over and makes it stable. Now, we have such things. Uh, the sun is gaseous, and so are the outer uh, larger planets. They're small enough that gravity takes over and they're stable. However, almost all of the large nebula that we see in space, they're expanding, they're stretching out, they're dissipating. In fact, with the nebula theory, we should not have any Earth or Moon. Those gases should have been just um, strung out every which way. And even if this nebular theory was somehow possible from the moon, if the gas could be compressed, the question is, well then why didn't the earth and moon gas come together? Why didn't we end up with one large object instead of what we have, a moon circling the earth? There are just no satisfying answers to these natural origin theories. Let me bring this to the present day. Because since nothing else works, astronomers are now proposing uh, catastrophes. And so this is the current view that's in all the astronomy books and on the internet. The suggestion is that four and a half billion years ago, a large Mars-sized object struck the Earth. They call this the collision or the giant impact theory. Now, we've already considered the, the daughter theory and the spouse and the sister theory. I don't know what to call this one. I'll let you make up your own word. But uh, it sounds like there's some violence involved with this one. In fact, uh, artists uh, like to draw pictures of this, and uh, they're kind of uh, interesting, the kind of thing they come up with where this collision is occurring. Not reality here, but artwork. The suggested collision partially melted both objects, the earth and the projectile. It threw massive amounts of debris high into earth orbit. The Earth gradually recovered and got its round shape back, and the space fragments coalesced into the orbiting moon. These days, what they're doing are computer simulations to try to get this thing to reproduce, you know, in an artificial sense on computer. And they're very complex, and they come up with pictures like this. Uh, this would be the idea right after the collision has occurred. I've looked at these computer uh, models. Some of them come up with no moon, and uh, some of them come up with uh, multiple moons. You know, I was thinking it's kind of uh, getting late in the evening, and uh, these computer models can get kind of complicated, so I found a simpler one. Uh, if uh, you want to get what we're getting at here, some object hits the Earth and uh, somehow is supposed to make the moon. The problems go on with the collision theory. Where did this large object come from that struck the Earth? the probability of a direct hit like that goes to near zero. Now, I know they make movies in Hollywood about objects hitting the Earth like that deep impact film, but it only happens in films, not in reality. And again, how did the moon assume a near circular orbit with some kind of a collision that's been proposed? Well, we've caught the trend here. As time goes by, these theories seem to roll on by. Each one lasts about 10 years, give or take, and then a new one comes along. Don't miss the significance of this. The moon is our nearest neighbor. The moon is 100 million times closer to us than the nearest nighttime star. Yet, there's no convincing science theory for its origin. We don't know where the moon came from in a secular science view. And I would think this certainly raises questions and doubt about all the other origin theories for the comets, for the planets, for the stars, and the galaxies beyond. Let me suggest an alternate to these uh, quick origin theories that we've looked at. I believe that uh, we have a better idea. And that idea 
is the fourth day of creation. To catch the details of that, you turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 16, which talks about the, the wonderful array of the heavens. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. This is what Isaac Newton believed, and most of the other pioneer astronomers who laid down our whole foundation of our current understanding of the universe. So the suggestion here is that the moon was placed in the sky on the fourth day of the creation week. And I believe the fourth day was chosen just to show us that the moon and the sun and the stars are not all that important. The moon and sun are not to be worshipped. They were on the fourth day. And the idea here is that the origin of the moon is beyond explanation. It's supernatural. Now, in our day, the word supernatural has kind of been defined as superstition. And I believe because of that, modern secular science has impoverished itself. Real science is the search for truth. And uh, this search, of course, leads directly to the creation view. Some of us uh, get intimidated by science sometimes. You read National Geographic magazine, you see all of the equations that the professors in the universities have, and uh, I know it can uh, kind of uh, make be worrisome to us. But let me challenge you that um, science, the study of nature, the study of creation, it's for us. And we should enjoy it most of all because we know who put this universe together and uh, we know who made the moon. We need to take science back. Let's think about how old the moon is. Just how many years have gone by? Now, the standard view is that the moon is about 4.5 billion years old. That's the same age that they give to the Earth and the solar system. Let's challenge this long age assumption from three different directions. When it comes to age, first of all, something a little bit complicated, let's consider what's called lunar recession. What this describes is that the moon's orbit is actually an outward going spiral. The distance to the moon is increasing about one and a half inches, that is about four centimeters per year. The moon is slowly moving away from the earth. We just don't notice it during a lifetime. This distance increase is due to the gravity interaction between the earth and the moon. The earth's high tide bulge, which does not occur directly beneath the moon, the Earth's spin carries the high tide mark slightly ahead of the moon. The high tide position is about 10 degrees beyond a straight line between the Earth and the moon. But the fact is, this bulge pulls forward on the moon. It propels it gradually outward and away from the Earth, just an inch or two increase each year. But now think back in time. This means that a century ago, the moon was about, on the average, 12 feet closer to the earth. And 6,000 years ago, the moon was about 12 miles closer to the earth. Now, when you move still further back in time, things get more complicated because this distance change is not linear. In fact, the rate of lunar recession varies very strongly as the sixth power of the distance between the Earth and Moon. If you would, for instance, take the Earth-Moon distance and cut it in half, then this recession is uh, not four times greater, and it's not 16 times greater, but again, if you cut the Earth-Moon distance in half, the recession increases by 64 times. This means that the current rate of the moon leaving the earth is four centimeters per year. But longer ago, it would have been four kilometers per year. 
and still longer ago, 4,000 kilometers per year. When you do all the numbers, they show that on an evolutionary time scale, the moon would have been in the near vicinity of the Earth about one billion years ago. As a result, the Earth would once again be inside, remember the Rausch limit, which breaks up objects like the moon? And uh, we, our moon would be dis disintegrated into a Saturn-type ring. Now, I'm not saying that the moon is a billion years old. I'm saying that there's a serious problem with the evolutionary time scale where they assume the moon is several billion years old. It does, it does not work out. And uh, by the way, this uh, Earth-Moon tide interaction that I'm describing also results in a slowing rotation of our planet Earth. Today is about one-tenth of a second longer than a day was 6,000 years ago. It's not enough to notice, but the days truly are getting longer. Let's move on to another idea. This second age concern involves a fascinating story from eight centuries ago. Back in 1178 A.D., stargazers in England reported something significant. They saw a large object hit the moon. There resulted an explosion and the formation of a new large crater on the moon. Here's how they describe it. The upper horn of the crescent moon seemed to split into two parts. From the division point, hot coals and sparks flew out. This was repeated a dozen times or more. Then the moon took on a blackish appearance for some evenings. We've never seen anything like that, but these medieval stargazers saw this explosion on the moon. This written report of fire on the moon is rejected by almost all astronomers today. After all, they say, lunar cratering surely ceased billions of years ago. A sizable new moon crater is thought to occur at best maybe once every million years or so. And if lunar impacts are truly this rare, then it's highly unlikely that anyone would see a new crater form. And so the conclusion in modern astronomy is that these sky watchers must have been mistaken. But these observers did indeed witness a lunar impact, a, a new crater forming on the moon. In fact, the resulting crater has been photographed by the Apollo space program and also by the Clementine spacecraft in, in 1994. This crater has been named uh, Bruno. It's uh, located, uh, let me show you where it is. Uh, the next time you have a clear sky and a full moon, it looks something like this, and you can see this with the unaided eye. In the upper right corner is a large uh, dark circle. That's one of these uh, lunar seas. Actually, it's an area of basalt. This one is called the Sea of Crises. And the crater is actually on the hidden side of the moon. It's right around that upper right corner. They saw the explosion, even though they couldn't see the crater, until we started to circle the moon and uh, take some uh, close-up pictures. Again, here's this crater Bruno, which recently formed. It's about 14 miles in diameter. This is 20 times larger than the Behringer Crater down in Arizona. This new crater on the moon appears very recent, and the ejected material is on top of the older sediment of the moon. This collision was uh, quite dramatic. It amounts to an explosion of 50,000 megatons of energy. This crater equals 5,000 Mount St. Helens eruptions. And by the way, lunar instruments that were left on the moon by the astronauts have actually detected vibrations of the moon. It's still ringing like a bell ever since this collision eight centuries ago. It shows that the moon was struck by a heavy blow in recent history. I believe that the formation of Crater Bruno challenges the assumption that the moon has been dead and unchanging for billions of years or more. Creationists see the moon as a young, dynamic satellite of the Earth. 
On the basis of Crater Bruno, I suggest that the rate of lunar crater formation may be much larger than is assumed, maybe a thousand times greater. In fact, maybe we could make a creationist prediction that any time during the next few centuries, the moon is due for another uh, a collision and a crater that we might see, so uh, keep an eye on the moon. First we had recession, and then I talked briefly about uh, Crater Bruno. And while we're on craters, how about all of these millions of craters that the moon has? Craters within craters. Where did they all come from? What is the history of these things? Geologists have concluded that the moon experienced a period of intense bombardment during a brief time early in its history. And then ever since, the moon has just been a silent, unchanging museum. Let me illustrate something here. Uh, we've had some technical talks this week, and you've seen some complicated graphs. Let me give you an easy one, the simplest graph we will see this week. Now, along the bottom, the horizontal, I'm just going to plot time. And that's the history of the Earth, the history of the solar system, the history of the universe, a few thousand years. And I did not label the vertical axis. In fact, I would like that to represent a number of things because there's an interesting trend in nature. What we are finding is that at one or more points in history, there was an acceleration, a speed up of many distinct events. Let me mention some examples. The Genesis Flood. I want to apply that to the peak that you see on this red curve. During that year-long flood, there was rapid formation of sedimentary strata and rapid formation of fossils. It was a unique event in, uh, in physical history. So there are things maybe changing kind of uniform today, but we had that singularity in history, the flood event. Let me add another one to this curve. There's been a group of creationists working for the last seven or eight years on something that's called the Rate Project. This group has been exploring radioisotope dating. Why is it that we come up often with multi-million or billion years for the ages of rocks, including moon rocks? What this group is concluding, and they have evidence to back it up, is that at some point in past history, radioisotopes speeded up in their decay. Half-lives were shortened. And so you can't uh, date rocks today and trust the answers because all the clocks have been reset. There was a point in history when radioactive decay was accelerated. And I'm letting that represent itself by that peak in that curve. Uh, because of that, we feel that uh, typical radioisotope dating has been invalidated. These two objects that I'm listing here could be plotted on the vertical axis of this graph. But let me add a couple of more. Now, we haven't said much about Mars. That's another interesting planet. It has craters on it. It has ravines and canyons. And it doesn't seem to be changing today. And the current view is that at some point in history, Mars experienced a, a short, intense period of geologic activity. It's represented by the peak in that curve. Something happened on Mars, even though it has settled down today. Now let me come back to our current topic, the moon. Remember all these craters we have, millions of craters? Maybe on occasion they're forming today, but a lot of them did form in the past. And uh, the thought is that many of these moon craters we look at form very quickly during one unique event in history. I believe that uh, all of these major events that I've listed, and many more could be added to this list, these discontinuities in our current uh, nature, I believe these all coincide at the same time in history. And the likely candidate for all of these events is the Genesis flood story. Now, I must say, I've always hesitated to say that the flood was accompanied by cosmic events on the moon and on Mars and in space. But the evidence does point to a large number of variables which experienced a temporary surge, and I believe this is most likely at the time of the flood. 
This needs to be worked out with creation details, why the flood event uh, hammered the whole solar system with craters, but it's an interesting area of research that is being addressed today. Now we come to the design of the moon. I really enjoy this part of creation. Something like the moon is not there by chance or accident. It's not a random event. But instead, there are reasons for the moon. God had purposes. He had plans for everything that he put in space. So uh, let me ask you, uh, what's the moon up there for? Does it do anything for you? Would you miss the moon if it was gone? I started a list. I got to thinking about this, um, why the moon is in the sky. And it turns out that this list goes on and on. And I'm sure it could be extended. But here's just a few purposes for this created moon that we enjoy. Now, some of the reasons are quite obvious. The moon is a night light. Remember the lesser light that rules the night? And of course, that's been precious through history. And maybe we've got street lights around our campus here, but for many people on the earth, that uh, reflected sunlight on the moon is still uh, very important. And of course, as we are finding out, moonlight is uh, very critical to agriculture and to the biorhythms of plants and animals and people. Next on our list, and let me put these together, the C words. The moon functions as a clock. Once you get familiar with moon phases, you can tell time by it. The moon is a calendar. You can tell seasons by the moon. The moon is a compass. You can tell directions. All practical reasons, I believe, why our Creator put the moon in the sky. Those three ideas, with the, starting with the C, just remind us of how regular the moon is. It's so dependable following the laws that were established back there during the creation week. This involves things like eclipses. We know exactly when the next eclipse is coming along. You can look forward to it, and it happens right on schedule because of these faithful, unchanging laws that govern our whole universe. In fact, while I'm talking about eclipses, uh, let me just give you a little um, a report for the future, something to look forward to. Now, um, some of you have seen a solar eclipse before, and I'm not talking about a partial eclipse that occurs every year or so, but a total eclipse of the sun when it gets dark during the daytime for several minutes and the birds get confused. Those are very unusual. Well, there's an eclipse of the sun uh, predicted and scheduled for uh, the year 2017. So uh, we need to hang on for that because uh, if you see the line across this map, it'll be going right through this area. In fact, it cuts right across the whole country. And this hasn't happened for a long time. Uh, this might be a good future investment in telescopes. This is going to really capture the country's attention as this approaches. And by the way, seven years after that, there's going to be another total eclipse quite similar right across the middle of the country. How do we know this so exactly? Because eclipses are like the compass, the calendar. It follows right on schedule. It's so very dependable. That's the way God made the moon. Now, of course, the other kind of eclipses are uh, lunar eclipses, and they make beautiful pictures. These are um, less rare. This happens every year or so when the moon moves through the Earth's shadow. This is just kind of an overlap picture here when the moon turns that uh, brownish-red color, uh, something else uh, just to, to, to look forward to. Now, some of the other purposes of the moon are not quite as obvious as a nightlight or a compass or a calendar. Uh, this is an interesting picture, by the way. This shows a, a waxing crescent moon. Can you see the thin moon there? Maybe you've seen that before. It's the, the greatest time of the month when uh, you have this moon. Uh, you know, this kind of uh, moon was um, very important to uh, Israelites in the Old Testament. Their calendar was based on the moon. And uh, they would call this a new moon when they could see this thin sliver. And they had watchers on the wall. When they observed this moon, that began their new month. It's always been a calendar, a way to keep track of things in past history. Now, some of these other purposes. The idea of stable seasons. Did you know that the moon is responsible for our seasons? And this is something that's been studied by computers really just in the last 15 years. Now, the Earth circles the sun once a year. And the Earth has a tilt of its axis of about 23 and a half degrees, and it maintains that. 
And so as the year goes by, the sun appears to move above the equator. That's our summertime. And then it moves below the equator, and that becomes summertime down under. And uh, so the seasons go. Computer studies show that it's the moon that stabilizes the tilt of the earth. With no moon, the Earth's axis would swing erratically between zero degrees and 90 degrees. Uh, We wouldn't know what was coming next. We might go from summer to a hotter summer. Our seasons would be unpredictable and certainly more severe. In fact, you can tie this in with Scripture. Psalm 104.19 declares that the moon marks off the seasons. It does, and it even helps control the seasons. I'm going through this list of purposes, and we're already down to the bottom of the list. Let me put these two together. This is, along with the moonlight, the one that we are most familiar with, the moon's tides. So just have some water to go with this. There is evidence that the lunar tides dominate the currents of the oceans. Now, these tides result from the moon's gravity pulling on the earth. These tide forces amount to an amazing amount. In fact, the number is 2,000 trillion tons of force. No wonder the oceans move with that kind of gravity pull from our nearest neighbor, the moon. In fact, the power generated by the tides equals that of all the power plants of the earth combined together. This constant motion of the ocean waters keeps the seas alive. If there was no moon, the oceans would soon become stagnant and unhealthy. The marine life, both the plants and the animals, would perish. The seashore would no longer be inviting. Now, there are vast amounts of floating plants in the ocean. We call them the plankton, the grasses of the sea. And there are also uh, larger sea plants. It is estimated that 30 to 50% of our planet's supply of oxygen is provided by this sea vegetation. After all, the oceans do cover three quarters of the earth. Without the moon, there would be no tides. There would be no marine plants. We would not have sufficient oxygen to breathe. Our very breath is dependent on the existence of the moon. It keeps the oceans healthy. We've looked at the moon's origin, and we find that supernatural creation makes good sense. No natural origin theory is convincing or adequate or comparable to the majesty of creation. Next, we consider the age of the moon, lunar recession, crater Bruno, and the many other craters which happen quickly, I believe, point to a youthful moon. And then we summarize several purposes of the moon. And what we find is that even in an imperfect world, the blessings provided by the moon are obvious and they're amazing. The moon is placed in the sky for our well-being. The moon is not only our nearest neighbor in space, it's a clear, beautiful, silent witness for the creation. Thank you.